want you to go to the Old Testament. Go to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Haggai. The last three books of the Bible are Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So go to Haggai. It's a really short book, but I want to preach from there. Haggai chapter 2. And while you're turning, I'm preaching a message called The Glory is Coming. And I really labored in prayer about what to bring to you today. I, I knew that this first Sunday back was very key and I wanted to have a word from God. And I mean, you just don't know how much I prayed and sought the Lord. And I really feel like God led me to this text. And I think I have some things really powerful to share today. Um, I'm going to be prophetic at times. This is a prophetic style message. And by that, I mean, there are going to be some things I'm going to challenge you with. And then there are also some things that I'm believing as I conclude the message that I'm believing are going to be predictive in a sense. And I know that if it's going to happen, God's going to have to make it happen. But I really feel like this is why God brought me over to this particular text. So let's read from Haggai chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. This is what Haggai says, and he's speaking for the Lord. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Isn't that a great word for right now? Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I love this line, in this place, in this temple, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Woo, y'all are already, already feeling it, aren't you? Come on, give Jesus a praise before you're seated for the reading of the word today. Hallelujah. Um, you can be seated. I don't have any anecdotes, no illustrations. I'm not, not preaching that way today. I'm going right into the Word of God. Let me just dig into this to see if I can get you to understand what's happening here. I'm really preaching Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Ezra, Nehemiah. It's just all put together, but I'm preaching the whole book of Haggai, but don't worry, we won't be here all day. Um, so here's what most people in the church understand. If you have any kind of Bible knowledge, God takes the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. They lived there for a long time, but they wouldn't serve God faithfully. And the longer they were there, the more they sinned. The longer they were there, they started worshiping idols and they forsook God. And God told them, they said, if you keep this up, there's coming a point where I'm going to kick you out of this land and you're going to go, you're going to be conquered and you're going to go into an exile. And he told them, he said, it's going to be for 70 years. Well, sure enough, how many of you know God always keeps his word? And that's exactly what happened. The Babylonians attacked, overthrew the land of Israel, the armies of Israel, tore the walls of Jerusalem down to the ground, uh, took the walls of the temple, tore it down to the ground, raised it to the ground. There's nothing left. Took the people into Babylon, and that's where they lived for nearly 70 years. These are where we get the stories of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel in the lion's den. This is where the book of Ezekiel comes into play. And so they're there for 70 years, separated from their land, separated from the temple. Well, you can read this in a history book. Eventually, the Persians rose up, and they conquered and overthrew the Babylonian Empire. And the Bible tells us this story. There was a king of Persia named Cyrus, and Cyrus decreed that the Jews could leave Babylon and go back to Israel and be restored to their homeland, that they could rebuild Jerusalem, that they could rebuild their temple. And this excited them. And the first wave of people that went was about 50,000 people, Jewish people, that returned to the promised land. And that brings us to the book of Haggai. Now, I want to teach you three things, and, and, and I want to correlate them because this is what the Lord showed me. The loss of the temple and the relocation to Babylon had a tremendous impact on the children of Israel. And let me show you what I mean. Number one, it was a time of deep soul searching. Deep soul searching. Sin and idolatry cost them greatly. It cost them their, their homes, their, their homeland. And during that 70 years, God actually purged 
Israel of its sin and its idolatry. They never worshiped false gods again. It, it worked. It was transformative. And so it was a time of soul searching. It was almost like it was transformative. And that was a good thing. The second thing that happened is that the children of Israel discovered that their faith in God could not only survive, but thrive without a temple and without being in the promised land. Uh, they didn't give up on God when they went there. That's why the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace and Daniel in the lion's den are such great stories because these men said, we're going to still be Jews and we're going to still maintain our Jewish faith and we're still going to serve Jehovah. And that's what happened. The Jewish people stayed strong to God and even got stronger in their faith and they got creative. They couldn't go to the temple anymore. So they built these things called synagogues. You ever heard of a synagogue? Well, there, there are still synagogues all over the world today. That's where the Jewish people meet together to study the Torah and the law and the prophets and where they meet together to worship. So they got creative in how to, we would say, how to do church. Okay? Then the third thing is that even though they were separated from the temple, the temple was gone, and they were no longer in Israel, they did not lose their fondness for the temple. As a matter of fact, it intensified. Let me show you what didn't happen. They didn't say, well, you know, we've been living here for 20 years. We don't have the temple anymore. We've kind of learned we don't need a temple. I guess this proves we don't really need a temple to be the, no, it was the opposite. They said, you know what? We don't have a temple, but oh, how we miss it. We miss the temple of God so much. I wish we had the temple. And there was, there was something that happened to them that said, we value the temple. There is significance to the temple. It is incredibly important to us. And that was something that needed to happen. Now, look, I'm telling you those three things because it happened to Israel, but it is evident to me that there is a tremendous similarity between what ancient Israel experienced way back then and what we have experienced in the present time, okay? First of all, because of COVID-19, obviously, we've been unable to come together in this place, We've been separated from the house of God. And it hasn't been 70 years. I, I got my calendar out last night, started counting. If I understand like, right, since the last time we met, it, it's been, I think, 63 days. But it's felt like 70 years. It's felt like forever. And so we kind of connect with that. And here's what I have learned. Number one, I think this season, these past two months, has been a time of soul searching for the church. I've heard stories of people who said, you know, during this time with all the upheaval and the pandemic, I've drawn closer to the Lord. I've read my Bible more. I've prayed more. I've sought the Lord. Um, I've realized more than ever before I need to give the tithes and offerings because the economy, everything's uncertain. I need to keep the windows of heaven open, and you've done that. You guys have been faithful to give, which shows your strong discipleship. I want to commend you for that. And I just think it's been a time where we've realized that, that we need to search our hearts and we need to get closer to God. I think it's kind of been a spiritual revival of sorts. The second similarity is that we have learned that even though we haven't had church, our faith has not died. Christianity has no longer, uh, has, it, has it died out, I guess I should say, but rather we're stronger than ever before. People have learned that your faith can both survive and thrive during COVID-19. And we've got creative. We didn't make synagogues, but we got online. <clears throat> it's been amazing how through, through virtual church, we've been able to connect together and be together. And that's creative. And we've been using Zoom for meetings and other technologies where the youth department, the youth can meet together. And Pastor Amy's been reaching out to parents and the children. So it's very similar. Finally, the third thing is, I don't think anybody has said, well, you know, already had not been coming to church some and been watching online. This just proves to me I don't need church at all. I mean, there might be one or two people out there like that, but they're the exception. Everybody that I've talked to has said to me, I miss my church. I can't wait to get back to church. Pastor, when are we going to have church again? This is killing me. I miss being with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so there's been a real similarity. And I think what's happened is we've discovered that we need our church. We need each other. And online services are great. 
It's been weird for me because those have been pre-recorded services. So I would come in here in an empty church with maybe Pastor Gabe or Pastor Billy, and I would preach to empty chairs. We've been excited today that there are people in here today. This has been exciting for us, real people. And so I preached on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday, usually Thursday, I'd come in here and I'd preach. Well, I've been just like you. I'm at home on Sunday morning watching myself preach. I was really blessing myself. Man, I really said some good things to me. I'm just, I'm telling you the truth. But I'm telling you, I watched it, and, I, and there's an anointing that would come through, and the singers, and it was great, and God was blessing, and we would get on there and chat, you know, on the online chat, and people were saying hallelujah, and woo, that's good, and, and I was getting tickled because I was at home, and I'd say, people said, preach, pastor, preach, and I'm thinking, I am, but it's on the screen, and it was just cool. We had all these cool things happening, but listen, as good as it was, it's not anything like this. I mean, I'm sorry for y'all that are at home today. And, and we understand why you're there, and we're glad that you're there watching this. But I'm telling you, oh, God, I'm about to shout. I'm about the Holy Ghost about to be all over me. It ain't, there's nothing like being in here right now. Woo! God, I feel the Holy Ghost. There's something about when the living stones come together to form a holy habitation, and then the Spirit of God comes down in the midst, and that's what's happening in this house right now, isn't it? Woo! I hope what you, what's happening here, I hope it's coming through that TV screen right now. Hallelujah, the presence of God is here. And so there's nothing like this. We need each other. We need the house of God. And can I just preach? Now I'm just going to be a little prophetic here. Let's be honest. And I'm not, I'm okay, I'm maybe, maybe one or two of y'all. But I'm just going to make it real broad. I think too many believers in America had taken their church for granted. I mean, that's what's happened. That's pre pre. COVID-19, a lot of people were taking the church because church had become an option for some. I mean, let's just be honest. Let's call it like it is, okay? If, Pastor, if I'm not going to the beach, uh, I'll be there. Well, we said we were going to go to the mountains this weekend, but I won't be there. Pastor, we're going to go camping over, over in Lake Hartwell this weekend. I won't be there, but I'll be there next Sunday, and so you got here one out of four. Well, it got quiet in here now. What happened to all that shouting? And my son's in travel ball. My girl does this. And if we don't have this and this, Pastor, we'll be there. It became an option. And let's be honest, for some people, it had become the last option. But the option got taken away. So did travel ball and everything else. So did going to the mountains. So did going to the beach. Everything. And now you got Sunday morning, and you're here, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, boy, this would be a great morning to go to church. Oh, wait a minute. We can't go to church. Church is gone. The option got taken away. And someone says, you don't appreciate something until it's taken from you. Okay? And so that's what happened is, is, is and, and I'm just going to preach. I'm just going to say this. This isn't my notes, but I'm just, because I, I, I have a gift to call things out as they are. It's a gift. Okay? Here, here's what we said, N- not you. Surely it's not you, but some people. They said, well, it, it's okay. It'll be there when we get back. Oh, yeah. Pastor, you're not supposed to know how we think. I know how you think. It'll be there when we get back. We can go to the mountains this weekend. We can go to the beach this weekend. We can go camping this week. It's okay. It's not going anywhere. It'll always be there. Well, guess what? It wasn't always here. And so what I think God is wanting to do in this season is Say to us, I want to do something transformative in you that just like Israel was purged of sin and idolatry, we need God to do something in the people of God that one more time we say, you know what? I'm not taking church for granted anymore and I'm not putting other things before God anymore. We need the church. My family needs the church. It is significant and valuable to me and to my kids. So here's the story. God ordained for a man named Ezra. There's a book in the Bible about his story. To lead the people in rebuilding the temple. And they responded and they began. And they started rebuilding the temple. But there was a group of people in the land. It was the people that remained, the remnant. And they were were a mixed race. We would know them from the New Testament as Samaritans. They did not like the fact that the Israelites were coming back and rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the walls and sort of taking over. And so they rose up in oppression against the children of Israel and terrorized the people. They were terrorists, and it worked. And paralyzed by fear, 
They stopped building the temple. And it wasn't 16 days or 16 hours or 16 months. It was 16 years they relegated God's house to second place. They lost their passion. They lost their love. It was there initially, but when fear came in, it all went out the window. They lost their concern. And they would feel guilty. They would feel guilty and they would say, well, I know we should get back to building the church, but you know what? Now is not the time. Now is not the time to build the temple. And this is in the book of Haggai. Now is not the time to build the temple. Isn't it amazing how we'll say, oh, this isn't the time. This isn't the right time. I'll come when I make time. I'll get saved when, when I'm through living my life. When I'm older, I'll get saved. I'll get busy for it. When are you going to get busy for God? It's, well, now is not the time of my life. I've got the kids. We've got too much going on. Well, when are you, when are you going to get involved in the church or get involved in the kingdom? I can't right now. I don't have the time because my business is going right now. I've got to give all my time to my business. One of these days, your business is going to burn up in fire, and the only thing left standing will be you and the kingdom of God. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. Same people did the same thing. Well, you got all the time. God's giving you the same amount of time every day, 24 hours. Somebody said there's no such thing as time management, just self-management. See, it's our choice. I told you, pull your shoes, pull your toes up in your shoes. We need this kind of preaching. So their focus moved from God's house to their own houses, and if you read Haggai, they spent time and money improving their houses and beautifying their houses, and their houses turned into mansions and luxurious. Meanwhile, they neglected the temple that lay half-built and lay in ruins. And so here's what happened. This displeased God, and he sent drought in the land, no rain, and this resulted in, in, in inflation and poverty and food shortages. And they just thought it was natural. It was just a naturally caused event. And then the prophet Haggai showed up and began to preach, and he said, oh, no, that drought is just not caused naturally. That drought is from the Lord. And the lesson was clear. They were neglecting the house of God, and God wasn't happy about it. And let me just tell you this morning, God takes pleasure in his house just like you do in your house. Have you ever stopped to think about that? God takes pleasure in this house, your, his house, just like he does in your house. And so it was an affront to him that they put their personal pleasures above his pleasures. And God said, I don't want to send a drought on you. I want to send blessings on you. But the only way it's going to come is you got to get back to rebuilding my temple. And so here's the challenge that I'm bringing to you today that for me is a direct correlation. And I think this is why God gave me this message and took me to this scripture. More than ever before, we need to get our focus on God. And we need to get our focus on his church. And we need to get our focus on doing the work of God. And we need to get our focus on spreading the gospel. And we need to get our focus back on expanding the kingdom of God. See, the people of faith, that's us, cannot become the people of fear. Have you seen how many people are afraid? People are just scared right now, terrified, just terrified that they're going to get COVID-19, terrified of the economy, terrified of the future. People are living in fear right now, and we've got to be careful as the people of God not to allow fear to control us and paralyze us and dictate how we live our lives for Jesus or maybe how we don't live our lives for Jesus. Hey, God's not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And, and I'll, I'm going to be out on the ledge here, and I did this in the first service, and I know this is being recorded right now, but I'll be honest, somewhere down the road, somebody's going to say, we missed it on this COVID-19 thing. It has not been as bad as, it is, as, as, we, as we thought it would be. Okay, and it's been played up by the media, and everybody's terrified, and people are wearing masks and all that, and people are getting bent out of shape. If they see somebody in the store not wearing a mask, people have, got, people have lost their minds. Have you noticed that? You see it on the news and others. It's because of fear. It's fear. They're terrified. Let me tell you something. If you're going to die, you're going to die. Okay, but this is not the time to be afraid. This is the time for us to walk in faith and trust God. We use wisdom. We're using wisdom in this church, okay? That's right. Give God a praise this morning. You've got to use wisdom. 
And we've used wisdom. That's why we have a two-part plan. And that's why the kids are in here today. And we're not putting them in classrooms. That's why we're doing all the things. We sanitize this building in between the first services. We're doing all those things. But a lot of it's not so much for us as it is for some people who are just nervous and afraid. Okay? But God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And let me just give you another warning. Satan, you better get ready for this. Satan will use the inevitable rebound of the economy to hinder us. Listen to me now. I'm speaking as a prophet. If we're not careful, we'll jump right back into the rat race. Economy will bounce back. Got to get my business going. Events and activities will start back up. And if we're not careful, we'll fall to the temptation to go after the material, neglect the spiritual. If we're not careful, we'll make church an option again. If we're not careful, we'll spend our time and energy building our kingdoms at the expense of God's kingdom. Now, let me be positive. Can I teach you a powerful principle of the Bible? When you make the things of God and God and the spiritual things first and and make it a top priority in your life, everything else gets taken care of by God. I'm, I'm going to teach. Can I teach you right now? Can I do some teaching? We'll do this fast. Two scriptures in the Bible. The first one is 3 John verse 2. 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health. How many of y'all like that? Woo, don't y'all like that? Oh, you say, Pastor, are you getting all in our stuff? And now you preach them. I kind of preach that stuff, Pastor. Come on, preach some blessing on me. All right, let me preach some blessing on you. The man of God is praying that the people in the church would prosper, be blessed, their businesses would grow, their finances would grow, and that everybody would be healthy. But hold on, the verse is not finished. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health. Watch this, you gotta watch the word. Even as your soul prospers. Not I pray that you prosper and be in health and I pray that your soul prospers. But no, there is a correlation. There is a connection. There is a stipulation. Even as your soul prospers. John said, I want you blessed. I want you healthy. But it is contingent upon your spiritual blessing and your spiritual health. And as long as you're prospering in your growth in the Lord and serving the Lord. I read the whole book of Ecclesiastes this week. And the book of Ecclesiastes says work your job. Make money. Eat, drink. Go go to restaurants. and Eat at home and grill you a steak. If you got enough money, you can do it. Buy a boat. Go enjoy the fruit of your labor. But he said, here's the end of it. That's not what's most important. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because you're going to have to give an account to God one day. So you have to put the spiritual things first. I want, I want to give you another scripture, Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God. And seek first his righteousness. Okay? Let God rule and reign in your heart. Do what pleases God. Live right. Treat people right. And then he said, those are spiritual things. And then Jesus said, and then all these other things in life that you go running after, they'll be added to you. You won't have to run after them. God will run after you and give them to you. We wear ourselves out going after things that will burn up in a flame of fire one day. But the things of the kingdom are what matters the most. So the people of God responded to the Lord's commands in two ways. They feared the Lord and they obeyed the Lord. They feared the Lord, and they obeyed the Lord. Let me tell you what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is a deep reverence for God. The fear of the Lord is being in a continuous state of holy awe before him. You don't ever get too flippant with God. You just need to look at God and go, wow, I'm overwhelmed. He is divine. There's nobody else like him. I'm just a man or a woman. I'm a human being. I'm immortal, but he's immortal. I'm, I'm finite. He's infinite. I'm powerless. He's all powerful. I don't know much. He knows everything. I'm limited in time or space. He's everywhere. He's, you're an awesome God. You notice your worship is a whole lot better in the fear of the Lord when you just, you're overwhelmed. And that's what happened. The people, of, the people of God got their eyes on God and saw him 
and, and were overwhelmed. Now watch this. When the Jews got their eyes on the Lord and gazed upon his power and might, you know what it did? It eliminated, eradicated, erased the fear of their enemies, the fear of the bad reports that were being given, the fear of the future. And then Haggai says that the Lord stirred up the spirit of the leaders and stirred up the spirit of the people and they got busy rebuilding the temple of God. And y'all, if there was ever a word for the church, this is it. We are inundated with bad news. We are inundated with these reports, these false reports. We are inundated with terrifying statistics on every hand. They're pumping them out every day. And we're looking. You know, some of us were saying, hey, in South Carolina for the first time yesterday, that's how we're so wrapped up in these reports. You know, we had more, there were still additional cases. But for the first time yesterday, there were no deaths reported. Well, hallelujah, that's good news. But we're tied up in all of this, see? And it's all so fearful and terrifying. You say, Pastor, so what do you want us to do? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to set your eyes on Jesus. I want you to get your eyes off of what you see around you and put your eyes back on Jesus. I want you to get in the Bible and listen to Jesus. I want you to hear the words of Jesus. Stop listening to all the epidemiologists and Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birch and everybody else and all these conflicting reports. I know we're going to hear them. They're on the news, but don't let them determine your, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Don't let them determine your spirit and your attitude and, and whether or not you're afraid and your nervousness and your mental and emotional state. Don't you do it. You get your eyes on Jesus and listen to Jesus. I, I've been waiting all I been waiting all morning to get to this part of the sermon. When I was growing up in the black churches, they used to say, whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. I said, whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. I said, whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. And they'd go all over the place. Y'all clapping over me singing a black song. The band's jumping right now. The band's saying, oh, I wish they could. Yvette would be up here double timing right now. But you know what? The reason I got that in my head and I couldn't wait to get to this point in the sermon and preach it is because that's the question to all of us. Whose report are you going to believe? And if you believe the devil's report, if you believe man's report, it's not going to help you and it's going to shake you. But if you'll say, you know what? God is still in charge. God is still on the throne. God is still the Lord God Almighty El Shaddai. He's in charge and everything's going to be all right. My God, I wish somebody just praise him in this house. Hallelujah. He is the sovereign God. And so here's my prayer. My prayer is, God, stir us up. Do like you did to those people and stir us up. Arouse us, waken us, kick us and say, get up, get busy, get to work. Because there is work to be done. We need to get busy for the kingdom's sake. Like Samson, some of us need to pray, Lord, remember me. Touch me one more time. Don't pass me by, God. Use me, use me. I need your touch. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm praying this. I'm praying for a lasting work of God in, in the people of God. I'm praying for a transformative work of God, just like sin and idolatry was purged out of the people of God. I'm praying, God, do something in us. How many of you, how many of you remember 911? Okay, I know not everybody was around 911, but a lot of us do. Everybody remembers where you were, okay, when 911 hit. What a horrible, horrible time. What a horrible, horrible day. And I can tell you way back then in 2001 when 911 happened, Everybody went to church. People, people all over America, unchurched people ran to church. Everybody was shook. Y'all remember that? For, and it lasted about two weeks. Two weeks. And then things started panning out and going back to normal. And when it did, all the people who ran to church quit coming. And I have been crying out to God, God, don't let that happen again out of this pandemic. But God, shake us and change us. And do something, a work in us that we have a passion for God and a passion for the church and a passion that is, that is transformative that stays with us for the rest of our life. That affects the decisions that, make and, uh, that we make and how we live our lives from this point on. I'm, I'm gonna, I want to close with the four promises, and we read them in our text, that God gave Israel. And I just want to close with this. And this is prophetic. Because the reality is, this makes for good preaching. 
You with me? What I'm preaching right now makes for good preaching. But if God's not behind it, that's all it's going to be is good preaching. So, so I need God. We need God. We need God. If this is going to happen, God's got to make these things happen. But I just really believe that God sent me over to this text to preach it today. Because I really believe that these are the things that we need to see and that we're going to see as we come out of COVID-19 pandemic. The first one is God is coming to his church. See, let me just give you the four. God said, I am with you. My spirit remains among you. Number two, an influx of people will come to this temple from everywhere. Number three, the temple will be filled with divine glory. I like that. How about y'all? And number four, people will discover peace in this house. Let me show you what I think God's going to do. I think God's going to do the same thing as we come out of COVID-19. God is coming to his church. The spirit of the Lord is here, isn't he? You know, I, I put this in my notes. We may have left the church, but the Holy Spirit never left us. He never left us. He stayed right with us. He's here. And y'all, people need a church where God is. People need a church where God shows up. And, and you say, well, isn't that in every church? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, there are churches, they, got a, they have a program, and, and some of them are older, and some of them are state-of-the-art, contemporary, but it doesn't matter. It's all about man, and it's all about the presentation, and somebody comes in, and they never experience God, and they walk out, and they never experience God. And I pray God forbid that ever happens at High Praises Church. I don't ever want that to happen here. I want people to come in and sit, and it might be crazy, or it might be more subdued doesn't matter about the effect. I want people to sit there and say, Whoo, I feel something. Somebody, something's touching me. Somebody, I feel God. I hear the voice of God. I feel like God's dead. If it's a sinner, I want sinners under conviction. If it's backsliders, I want backsliders under conviction. If it's God's people, I want them feeling the touch. If they're hurting, I want them to be healed. If they're struggling, I want them to find strength. If they're having doubts, I want them to have faith. If they came in hopeless, I want them to walk out with hope. Come on, somebody. The only way that happens is Jesus. Jesus has to be in the house. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And I believe that we're going to have the manifestation of God's presence like we've never seen. How many of y'all feel him right now? <laughs> I feel him in this house. So not only is God coming to his church, but people are coming to the church. He said there's going to be people, an influx of people from all of the nations that come to the temple. He said, come to, he said, come to the desire of all nations. And if you read it, it's talking about the temple is going to be the desire of all the nations. He's going to shake the nations, and they're going to shake loose from all their other false gods and say, we need to get to God's house. And I just believe that we've seen this online where people have connected with churches virtually. I've talked to pastors who might pastor a church running 50, but they're talking about how they've been doing online these last two months. They said, we're reaching 120 people outside of our church. You know, we're reaching people above and beyond. And they're saying, we're reaching people all over, all over America. Some people are even having viewers around the world. This whole thing has pushed the church into, a, into the digital age, into a whole new realm of ministry. But like I said, that's going to continue and thank God we were on the cutting edge on the front end of that. But listen to me. People still want to come to a house of God where they can get answers and where they can connect. And I think we're going to see an influx of people coming back to the house of God. And then the glory is coming. The glory is coming. What is the glory? The glory is God's identification. The glory is how you recognize God is in your midst. And I am praying not just for a manifestation of God's presence, but I am praying for a manifestation of God's power like we have never seen before. I'm talking about miracles, signs, wonders, healings, deliverances. I'm talking about God doing things that the only explanation is God did it. And I thank God for what he's done the last 21 years in this church. But I believe that the next 21 years are going to be even greater. And like he said, the greater of this of glory of the temple, the glory of this temple is going to be greater than the glory of the previous temple. And I'm telling you, I believe that whatever God has done the last 21 years of high praises existence, God's going to do greater things. Anybody in this house believe that? Anybody in this house want to see that? Where God does even greater things than we've ever seen before. 
See, I know some of you who have been with me now for all these years and older, we can tell stories of the glory of God. We can tell stories of miracles and healings and powerful things that God has done, and that's awesome. But there is a whole generation coming behind us, whether it's the millennials or Generation Z, and there'll be the kids after them who are saying, you know what, we like to hear those stories, and those stories are cool, but we want our own stories. We don't want to just hear about what God used to do. We want to see God do something in our day, and I do too. I want to see God move. I want to see God work. I want you to have your own stories of the miracles and the healings and the deliverances and the power of God in these last days. I'm praying for it. I believe the glory's coming. I believe y'all need to come every Sunday ready for something powerful to happen in this house. So God is coming to his church and people are coming to his church and the glory is coming to his church and this is the last one. I believe what's going to happen this post-pandemic is that sinners are going to come to the church. And more importantly, sinners are going to come to Jesus. I love that last line in Haggai that we read, verse 9 of chapter 2, where he said, and people in this house, people will find peace. And if you're in sin, you don't know Jesus, you're miserable. There's an internal conflict that's going on inside of you. There's a conflict between you and God. The Bible calls it enmity. You're at war. You're full of guilt for what you've said and done. You're full of fear because you're afraid you're going to die in your sleep and wake up in hell. You're full of shame because of the disgrace of what you did, the wrong choices and actions you've made. And shame is a terrible weight. It's just horrible. There's no peace. You cover it up with alcohol and drugs or affairs or, or relationships or work or whatever. Pick whatever it is. Pick your medicine. You're just, and all it does is just gloss over the surface. But, surface. but when that thing wears off, the stark reality is you're still away from God. But we have an answer, y'all, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's a gospel of peace. And when people hear the good news about Jesus and what he did and what he can do, everything changes. God saves and restores, and, and, and somebody said when you are at peace with God, it's only then that you know the peace of God. Let me say that again. It's, it's when you are at peace with God that you only know the peace of God. And when a, when a man or a woman who's in sin humbles themselves, confesses their sin, asks for forgiveness, repents and turns from that sin and takes and receives and confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior, y'all, the guilt, the fear, the shame goes. The enmity with God is eliminated. He's no longer your foe. He becomes your father. And peace comes in. Peace, joy, and love like you've never known. And y'all, I'm telling you, till the day I retire, die, or whatever happens, I want to see people. I want to finish my life. I'm still young. I'm 54, but I'm just telling you, I want to spend the rest of my life helping people come to peace with God. How many of you want to see that happen at high praises? Because isn't that what we're about? That's what we're about. I want you to stand with me this morning.